He was a monster in human skin. She was the survivor who defied death. Lawrence Singleton is a name synonymous with evil. In a chilling tale of brutality, this former merchant seaman became infamous for his horrific attack on a teenage girl named Mary Vincent. Mary Vincent came from the neon-lit environment of Las Vegas, a product of the rigorous upbringing of her casino-employed parents. Her teenage years, meantime, were marked by revolt. Often absent from school, she regularly disobeyed parental authority and even moved about in a nomadic manner with her boyfriend, living out of a car in the seaside town of Sausalito, California. When her boyfriend was arrested on serious charges of assault, Vincent was forced to seek refuge with her uncle in Soquel, California, ending this turbulent chapter. Driven by a need to see her grandfather, Vincent headed toward Corona, California, a suburban paradise on the outskirts of Los Angeles. On a disastrous September 1978 day, the young, adventurous soul discovered herself hitchhiking along the Berkeley, California freeway, a frequent means of mobility for those with minimal means at that age. Driven by an elderly enough man to be her father, a blue van offered her a ride. Vincent, confident and self-assured, accepted the offer, despite advice from other hitchhikers about the man's disturbing manner. The man driving was Lawrence Bernard Singleton, an early 50s commercial seaman. A false sense of security caused Vincent to get lazy as the trip went on. She attributed his early gestures to the man's age and maybe loneliness, discounting them as mere oddities. She had no idea that this apparently everyday meeting was about to become horrifically bad. When Singleton stopped for a little stop on their road excursion, things became really bad. Eager to stretch her legs, Vincent got out of the van and savored the little getaway from the packed quarters. Everything changed right away as she stooped to tie her shoes. Her world vanished to black as she collapsed to the ground after a terrible hit to the back of her skull. When Vincent arrived, she felt terror. Over her singleton loomed, his features distorted in a manner she had never seen before. She was helpless, caught, as he unleashed unthinkable cruelty. Every syllable he spits carried threats, and horror paralyzed her. Her spirit cracked, her body bruised, her wrists shackled, Singleton drove her once more, her fate unclear. Driven to a far-off location, he finally released her hands, only to compel her to sip something disgusting. The flavor was sour, and soon the alcohol hit her like a hammer, driving her farther down the path of suffering. Larry determined the girl would have to go since he may perhaps identify him and sexually abused her repeatedly. Mary woke up and Larry told her to lie on the road. She kept begging him to let her leave. Calm and cool, Singleton stood there carrying a hatchet. He started asking, You want to be free? I will release you. Time appeared to slow as he raised the sword and mercilessly brought it down. Vincent's cry reverberated throughout the barren space, but it went unheard as her arms were cut off from her body. Shoving her into a concrete conduit as though she were nothing more than trash, Singleton left her there damaged and thrown away. Though the darkness was choking and the suffering was intolerable, a tiny spark of life still burned inside her. Vincent crept out of that awful spot, her body screaming in agony, every last bit of strength. Driven simply to survive, naked and exposed, she lurched toward the freeway. The first cars that passed by turned away from her, too startled and afraid to stop. Ultimately though, a couple on vacation noticed her and couldn't turn away. Stopping to try to console her, they covered her in anything they had in their car. They drove Mary to the closest airport, asked for assistance, and turned Vincent over to be cared for by medical experts. Resilient in the face of unfathomable suffering, Mary gave police a thorough composite sketch and description of her assailant, which turned out to be very vital evidence. Larry Singleton's arrest resulted from a neighbor of his identifying him from the sketch. Six months later, Mary was facing her assailant in court, where her bravery helped to get his conviction. Singleton received a just 14-year prison term, despite the seriousness of his conduct. If I had the power, I would send him to prison for the rest of his natural life, the presiding judge said, clearly frustrated with the few choices for sentencing. Still, Singleton exhibited no regret. Leaning toward Mary in a freezing moment during the trial, he muttered, I'll finish this job if it takes me the rest of my life. His comments shivered the courtroom, highlighting the risk he still presented. Mary later obtained a $2.56 million civil ruling against Singleton, but she couldn't recover a thing since he had no assets on record. The people clearly objected to Singleton's low sentencing, 
Many believed that justice had not been done, and this group's indignation resulted in major law changes. Passed was the Singleton Bill, which forbade early release of felons who had utilized torture in their crimes and permitted 25 years to life terms for such offenders. With Singleton behind bars and Mary's life gradually returning to normal, one could wish this marks the end of her suffering. Unfortunately, that did not apply. The incident left Mary with physical and emotional wounds that permeated all elements of her existence. Once her main delight, she battled to keep relationships, a stable job, and follow her love for dance. Notwithstanding these obstacles, Mary turned her suffering into a committed mother of two and a successful artist. Although these successes provided her some comfort, she could never completely run from the shadow of the man who had so mercilessly changed her life. Conversely, Larry Singleton only spent eight years of his 14-year sentence. He benefited from early release because of good behavior and his work as a prison teacher's assistant. Because he is so out of touch with his hostility and anger, he remains an elevated threat to others' safety inside and outside prison, his psychiatrist said before his release. Singleton was rejected in every town he tried to reside in upon parole. Given his horrific past, residents were understandably disgusted by the idea of him living close by. Singleton was finally allowed to live in a trailer on the land of the San Quentin Jail following repeated abortive attempts at relocation. Singleton went back to Florida, his home state finally, but his legal troubles continued. Two times in 1990 he was found guilty of theft. Each time he received a 60-day sentence. Though they were small, inexpensive items, these thefts served as a reminder that Singleton had not changed even during his incarceration. On February 19, 1997, in Tampa, Florida, a neighborhood house painter spotted a horrifying scene through the window of a nearby residence. Inside, a nude man covered in blood was stabbingly a dead naked woman on a sofa over and over. Horrified, the painter called the police and described the visual elements, even pointing out that every stab created the horrific crush of bones. The man in the center of this savage onslaught was Larry Singleton, Roxanne Hayes, a mother of three who was working whatever she could to help her family, was the victim, a 31-year-old. She had agreed to meet Singleton for 20 bucks, but what happened was an incomprehensible tragedy. Later on, Singleton said Roxanne struggled since she had tried to steal more money from his wallet than they had agreed upon. He insisted that she came away from this fight and stabbed several times. Still, his narrative soon came apart under examination. The evidence from the house painter made it abundantly evident that Roxanne had been still, unable to resist, as Singleton executed his vicious attack. Singleton tried but failed to commit suicide following the murder. He was then sent to a psychiatric facility before being taken to jail to wait for trial. Combining his past with the savagery of his crime caused great indignation and a fresh sense of urgency to see justice done. The lady whose life Singleton had destroyed years previously Mary Vincent flew from California to Florida to testify against him. She aimed to make sure another victim would not suffer the same atrocities she had. Mary told the court the specifics of her own horrific event, vividly depicting the violence Singleton was capable of. I was raped. I got my arms cut off. He carried a hatchet. He dropped me off to die. Her statement served as a sobering reminder of the threat Singleton presented so casting little question about why he deserved the toughest penalty available. Singleton's defense sought to contend that, driven by intense emotion, he had not meant to kill Roxanne. Rather, it was a sad error. The jury saw through this defense, though, and after four hours of deliberation, decided him guilty of murder. Larry Singleton received a death sentence on April 14, 1998, for the cruel and horrible murder of Roxanne Hayes. Singleton seemed apathetic and without regret for his crimes as the judge sentenced him. In his last comments, Judge Anderson denounced Singleton's actions, saying, This was an unjustified, senseless death of a human life. Our times are better than those of Sodom and Gomorrah. Spending the following few years on death row, Singleton awaited his execution. But at 74, he passed cancer on December 28, 2001, before his sentence could be served. Though Singleton's passing signaled the end of his existence, it did not bring any closure for everyone. Many think Mary and Roxanne were not his only victims. Singleton might have been behind as many as a dozen murders over the years. So that is all the time we had today, folks. Hope you enjoyed this video. Do not forget to subscribe to our channel 
and do hit the bell icon on your way out. See you all next time.